Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. In this video, we continue on with the book titled The Man Who Knew by Ralph Waldo Trine. I do have other books by this author, so I did create a playlist for him so you can check that out. And also, if you just found us at this video and would like to catch up with this book, please check the playlist and grab those other chapters. And you, my subscriber, thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I have been enjoying your comments. Thank you so much for posting. And it's been really, really wonderful to know that I'm not alone on the journey. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing I want to share a couple things about the previous chapter, the law of life and the creative power of faith and courage. Well, if you haven't noticed, you could see that the author used scripture throughout this whole book which provides the reader a source where to verify what he is writing. And in a sense, it is documented the character of the man Jesus, the vision which he was provided with, the passion and the courage to go and follow through with that passion, that purpose of life, and that mission. He knew his mission. He wasn't swaying from it. He woke up with a purpose. And he wanted to share with humanity what he had learned, whether it was something that he had learned through his travels and then received insight to, but he knew that life the way that we were living it was not the right life. And that man, the way that we knew ourselves to be, that there was more to us, that man in the carnal is just one part, but to not overlook that we are spirit also, and the connectedness of that, and that the kingdom of God is within us, that we all can have that insight like he did and live a life-fulfilled purpose in this expression of love. Now, he did say in that previous chapter that God is love, and that's where the first commandment, when the lawyer asked Jesus, you know, what is the first commandment? And then Jesus responded, as according to scripture, that, to love God above all, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. But anyway, I want to share with you that. I've said this before. I've had a near-death experience about 15, 16 years ago. And I was in a meeting and literally just my lights went out. Um, took a while for the paramedics to get there. And they were trying to resuscitate me. Now, the experience that I had in that space was incredible one that is stays with me and that's why i usually it's it's really hard when somebody else tells you well this is what they experienced because it's their experience and for some other people that have never experienced this it's very hard to even fathom you know what that is like and what i can tell you is that as you can touch somebody's bones and feel that it is real this experience was very real to me and in that space, when I was not here in the physical, I was somewhere, somewhere not here, but somewhere everywhere. As I mentioned before, I could hear the angels sing. And it was as, as a choir that never stopped singing. And it was kind of in, in, in the sense that you could feel the music in your cells. Um, and the thing is that I myself did not have a body, but I, I could sense that I was separate. And yet I was in the presence of what I would use the word is God. But I knew in myself that it was me coming home to my fullness of the unity with God. And, and I was feeling so much love and I was feeling this love. It was penetrating every part of me as if, if I was if it was the air that I was breathing. And the, the songs of the angel was the most beautiful. I could almost see the angels, but I couldn't see the angels. I knew of their presence all around me. It's almost like like is, like if you're standing wherever you are right now, and imagine if you could see the molecules floating around, those were the angels. And all they were doing was singing this beautiful song as if they could not stop. You couldn't tell where one started singing and the other one finished, but they were singing at like a song without an ending and you could sense that this song was in adoration for the creator adoration that was sustaining the creator and i 
was feeling loved like I have never in my life been loved. And to to bring that back with me is just an amazing thing to always remember that I am loved. And yet I know that I love too and that I have the capacity to love like that. And that, that stays with me. The thing is, I remember my name being called and it was so, so, so far away. And I spoke out to God, which I felt was in front of me, but I felt it was within me. It was really, I don't know how to explain that. So there are no words. We as humans don't have the words on how to describe, (laughs) describe this amazing, amazingness. I don't know what to tell you. But I said, can't they see that I am happy? Can they not leave me alone? And this energy, it's as if it was talking into my very cell, said, you are not finished. Your work is not done. And next thing you know, I, I was breathing. I took a deep breath. And I've contemplated about this experience that happened to me. And it's interesting because it's been so long and it wasn't until recently, and I'm talking, what, 15, 16 years later, that I get it. Because I still felt separated from source, I was not ready. So I still have a lot of work to do, and I know I do. And I hope that every day I can get closer to that because that is how we are meant to feel, whole. We're not meant to feel separate. I believe there's a something inside of me telling me that if I feel united with my source, it doesn't mean that I'm leaving. It just means that I've arrived. And so the bottom line is I agree with the message of Jesus that God is love. So let's go on now to this next chapter how his truth started and then became distorted. Immediately following the official killing of Jesus, the light bearer to his people, is the account of the resurrection. It is so familiar to all that it will not be dealt with here. Our concern is primarily the life of the master and this for the value of his great life message to the world. Almost immediately after his going, departures from from his own message of truth and thereby distortions began. These were made more or less innocently at the time because his immediate followers were confronted with such absorbing occurrences and experiences. His great concern, greater than life itself, was the giving and the spreading of his great truth that would give his people freedom in a larger life, his gospel of the kingdom of God. As it came so clearly to him, he gave it freely and untrammeled. Hence the overlords of his, the Jewish religion, fearing for themselves and the institution through the spreading of his truth, and growing through their bigotry to hate him personally, killed him. The common people, his own people, who heard him gladly and followed him so eagerly, unquestionably deplored this, but they could not help themselves. In delivering his truth and getting it established in the world, he did not depend upon numbers. He did not depend upon an organization. He probably never thought of one, for he gave no instructions or direction along that line to his few followers. His observation of such organization in the ecclesiastical group that killed him possibly gave him warning against this. Anyway... We know that he made no effort to establish any organization, or as we say, a church. A church came into being later, but was so far as we know neither directed nor sanctioned by him. It is a help for us not to forget that Jesus was a Jew. His mother was a Jewess, and his father was a Jew. John the Baptist, his cousin, whom he esteemed and whose work he valued so highly, was a Jew. All of his twelve disciples, as far as we know, were Jews. Practically all of his followers before and for some time after his death were Jews. 
The seventy to whom he gave his simple directions to go forth and to spread his gospel of the kingdom of God were Jews. They and the twelve, or later the eleven, following his example, carried his message either to groups out in the open or to the congregations assembled in the synagogues, humble or mere pretentious as they found them. At first, there was but very little difference between the beliefs of these groups and the message of his followers as they carried it to the Jewish communities already established. The congregations of the synagogue that the Messiah had already come was the message at first. The aim and purpose was to prepare as many souls as possible to believe in the risen Jesus and to prepare them for the second coming, which they uniformly believed would be in a very short time. The great majority, however, preferred to remain true to their Jewish traditions. So in this way, a new set of Judaism, the followers of the Nazarene, arose in Jerusalem and in Galilee. It was not a new religion. Then outside, Hellenized Jews, who had had a larger contact with an outlook upon life, began to be attracted to the new sect. The addition of these and a few Gentiles here and there and the burning zeal of fresh leaders combined to make a noticeable growth in this new Jewish sect. They began then to seek members outside the Jewish fold. One of the first missionaries to preach to people outside Jewry was Philip, a Hellenized Jew. Driven from Jerusalem by persecutors of the sect of the Nazarenes, he carried their message upside down the country. He established himself at Caesarea to the north and made it the center of his work for many years. A second apostle and missionary to accept Gentiles into the fellowship of the Nazarene was Peter, who began but a short time after the death of Jesus to preach the risen Jesus and his early return right in Jerusalem itself. Then came Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, at one time persecutor of the Nazarenes, now converted whose ardent enthusiasm in spreading the gospel of the new sect made him known as the great missionary. This great ambition to carry the new gospel outside Jerry to the Gentiles caused him to become known especially as the apostle to the Gentiles. His ardent and long-continued work prevented the new gospel as it developed and spread from becoming merely a new, even if influential, Jewish sect. It was at Artioch, a Syrian city, that the gospel of the second coming was preached with such fervor and drew so many non-Jews that its adherents broke away from the synagogue and became quite independent with a religion of their own. They called themselves Christians. They were the first to be so known. We see here both the Greek and the Hebrew connection. Their term, Christian, came from the Greek word Christos, equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah, and means anointed one. The accounts of those exceedingly interesting and at times adventurous missionary journeys of Paul with his companion Barnabas refer often to their carrying on their work in and through the Jewish synagogues which they found already established almost everywhere they went. Others then began to spread the gospel of the new sect of the Christians. We are told that before either Paul or Peter went to Rome, there was a little Christian center established there. It is interesting to follow the facts then to learn that the early Christian church, the Church of the Disciples, was never founded as such, but grew in this natural way out of and had its first home in the Jewish synagogue. When Jesus gave his instructions to the twelve and later to the seventy, as he sent them out to spread his gospel of the kingdom of God and to heal those who needed help, he did not, so far as we know, tell them to form any organization or even to go to any already formed. The carpenter teacher of Galilee was a layman, never a churchman. His was a larger, a universal consciousness and purpose, therefore his greater power and influence. He became a churchman only through appropriation on the part of others. 
It was not so pronounced in the few earlier years, however, so far as distortions of his own message were concerned. The simple statement of belief or creed of these early Christians was, Faith in God the Father and His Son Christ Jesus and love of the brethren. They were mostly simple folk imbued by a strong community spirit and held things in common. There was equality of rank in their meetings. Later, the office of elder arose in the individual congregation and that of bishop in connection with groups of congregations. Through the zeal of the apostles and missionaries, the new faith began before long to spread rapidly. The Roman authorities took alarm and began to persecute, as we have already seen. But Rome was even then declining, and the people were getting so little from their own religion that many of the well-to-do and influential sought the new religion. At first, it was embraced primarily by the poor and humble. As it came under the Gentile, and especially the Greek and Roman influence, it became rapidly more speculative in its form and more intricate in its organization. There remained but little of the simple but vital teachings of the prophet of Galilee as he gave them. The metaphysical disputants, in their efforts to define and explain and build an organization, pushed these so completely aside that they became as good as lost. As time passed, the Roman organization grew so influential that in the early part of the 4th century, the emperor Constantine, seeing that he might use it in a political way in entrenching himself against his enemies, made it the official religion of the empire. All persecutions then ceased. This was in 324. Already their metaphysical speculations and formulations had brought about dissensions and divisions, which gave promise of disrupting the organization. Constantine, to secure unity again for his political support and safety, called, in 325, the first great council at Nicaea, at which, after a great deal of bitter wrangling and fighting, the Nicene Creed was formulated. There was never any unanimity of opinion, but finally one of the two bitterly contending factions won. This conclave was to determine primarily the nature of and more particularly the inner nature of God by vote, also the real relation to him of the Son. After many stormy sessions, of which the less said now perhaps the better, as for example when Arius, the chief and noted leader of one of the two factions, got up to speak, Nicholas of Myra struck him a blow in the face. The votes were finally counted, and what was to be known as the doctrine of the Trinity emerged. The decision was that God was three persons, fully distinct but separate, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but one God. No one has ever understood it, and it has been the source of endless wranglings and divisions ever since. It was so empty of value, possibly so inconsequential in his mind, that the Son never concerned himself with it. It shows, however, that theorizing speculation will do. Later, when ambitious ecclesiastics of Constantinople and Rome effected the great schism which divided Christendom into two bodies, the Greek and Latin churches, it was caused by disagreement in connection with one word, the Latin word filioque, meaning and the Son. To this day they are still apart. The ecclesiastics in their rivalry and hatred wrangle and the people suffer. They take the prophet of Galilee from the cross and speculate and try to explain and relate him. An enigma takes form, their formulation, and in the process, his own great life teaching is emasculated and denied to the world, at least through the creeds of the high towering system that they build. One of our most authoritative historians of religion and the church, dealing with the first conclave of Nicaea and then with several others that followed, to the year 451, writes, quote, Over 300 bishops and many hundreds of priests, deacons, and acolytes gathered at Nicaea. They were for the most part zealous believers, 
or disbelievers in the doctrine of Arius. For the first time, the Mediterranean world saw vividly displayed that bastard form of faith, dogmatic conviction which Europe was fated to inherit from Greece and to suffer from for so many centuries. One frenzied sect was ready to go to the stake for their belief that God the Father and God the Son were homoousio, and the other for the belief that they were homoousio. Even now, in nearly 2,000 years, the world has hardly yet discovered that they were only attempting to measure the most unfathomable of facts with formulas and criticisms adapted to no higher purposes than those of a deplorably decadent school of grammarians. Let us dispose in a few words of what the Church did establish as its creed by the operation of its early councils, so as to leave as soon as possible a subject so humiliating to human intelligence. But thy dwell on these dogmatic dissensions when the fundamental point, after all, was that the peasant of Galilee, whose speech was Aramaic, whose mind was so simple and direct, would never have recognized in these subtleties these frantic death struggles of the moribund Greek intellect, the teaching which he attempted to set before mankind. All we need dwell on these creeds for is to see in them a certain landmark, the end of a certain well-defined phase. With them, the formative period of Christianity closes and the religion has become rigidly constitutionalized. End of quote. We are dealing with these matters very briefly and leaving them now as quickly as possible for a specific purpose, and we are dealing with them entirely from an historical standpoint, for practically all forms of religion in Christendom today, Greek, Roman, and Protestant, have had their common origin. A few devout people, in their concern lest any changes be made, speak of our great historic creeds. There is no such thing, at least to which the word great can be rightly applied except great in obscurantism. The question that must be faced today is, do we want the system of Christianity handed down to us by these speculative ecclesiastics of a totally different age, a system brought about by their attempts to explain and then formulate a system about the Christ of Galilee, or do we want these vital life-giving teachings, the religion of the Christ of Galilee, which he, perceiving so uniquely and clearly, labored so devotedly to convey and leave in the life of the world? In the minds of the thinking young men and women of today, there is no question. Upon them will depend the future continuation of what we term Christianity. It is a decision that can now be neither dodged or delayed. End of chapter 21. We're going to stay right here. I'm going to roll on right to the next chapter. So if you want, go ahead, go grab your tea, your coffee, or your wine, and sit back. 22, titled, The Truth That Must Save Christianity. We are face to face today with a condition different from any in our history. We must realize it. Thinking men and women, devout men and women are asking, what's the matter with Christianity? Young men and women are keen in truth seeking, with life before them and longing for the best in life are asking, what is Christianity? They constitute a mighty potential force outside and independent of Christianity, or to be one to it and swell its ranks. If they are told it is a life to be lived, vitalized and beautified and divinely socialized through the simple fundamental message of the Master, the man who knew, they will be drawn to it. If they remain of the opinion that it is a system of belief, an intricately formulated system, hoary with age and impotent because inadequate for our present day needs, delivered to us by the dead of the past, who in their eagerness to explain the master, forgot the message, so that it never found statement as the dominating factor in any creed, and in most cases not even a mention, then they will not be drawn to it. There is something in the first view so life-building and so necessary as a help in satisfactory, happy, and therefore successful life that, rightly perceived and presented, it will draw and attract the young men and women of today. 
there is no longer any appeal in the other conception in the face of present-day knowledge and facts. To morons, yes. To thinking young men and women, no. They cannot be interested and they will have none of it, and therein lies a mighty loss. I said but recently to an outstanding forward-looking minister of one of our churches who possesses an unusual appeal and magnetic force for young people. Our churches, Christianity, today are facing a very critical condition. Their statements of belief, their speculative statements about the master inherited from the past, no longer interest our thinking young men and women. Some of the things the old creeds contain seem to them not only inconsequential, but even untrue. They do not fit with present-day knowledge. In a few years from now, the majority of those in our churches will be gone, if their places are not taken in sufficient numbers by this oncoming, clear-seeing, truth-loving, fear-free generation, then the Church's power, as an agency for righteousness mighty and prevailing, to say nothing of their ability even to carry on, ceases. The fact must be faced, and the quicker it is faced, the better. You are right, he replied, and the bulk of my fellow ministers with whom I come in contact are thinking and saying the same thing. The necessity of the restatement of their articles of creed and forms of present-day truth, as life and action, is no longer open to doubt. It must be a statement brief, simple and clear-cut, built upon the Master's fundamental truth as a way of life, and not a series of statements primarily to explain Him or to inculcate any theories or beliefs about Him. There is where the mischief has been done. There's where, or rather, why his truth has been so emasculated. There lies the cause of all the contentions, the fights, the divisions, and the weakening of Christianity. I sought my friend's experience and views arising primarily from his unusual contact with the younger generation for aid in writing a book, this book. I said to him, an author in preparing a book, a book of serious and, he hopes, helpful content writes it naturally with the purpose of reaching the largest number of readers. He doesn't want to alienate and he doesn't want to fail to show due respect for the beliefs of others. At the same time, I feel that he should be absolutely fearless in dealing with truth in his statements of present-day facts and conditions as he sees them. I have given the matter careful thought for a number of years. I am now positive that certain things should be said and without any mincing of words or soft peddling of facts. There is a critical condition that must be faced quickly and should be helped, not by way of destructive thought from any source, but with every sincere effort at constructive accomplishment. My admiration for our churches for the fine work, helpful work that their ministers have done outside their pulpit utterances and which the world at large doesn't know and doesn't at all fully appreciate, is so great that I long to see them bridge and successfully bridge the chasm which lies immediately ahead. There is no finer body of men, no more self-sacrificing and useful and helpful in our country than the great body of ministers in our various churches. The great bulk of them is forward-looking, eager to present the truth, the master's truth of life. They need to be less hampered. They need help. There, interrupted my friend, you have touched the point. We do need help. You are right, absolutely right. Say the thing that you feel needs to be said. Say it boldly. Don't hesitate. Our councils are slow moving, too slow for the good of the church and the greater good that it might do. You, as a layman and with no shackles, can say things that we cannot say so well, although some of us may feel them just as keenly. To get the fresh and vigorous blood of youth into our churches is one of our greatest needs for their help and their work, for their thought and their influence in rejuvenating, or one might be bold enough to say, reforming Christianity. Therefore, I would say to any young person, whether he is empathetic or indifferent or antagonist towards Christianity, that our churches are guided by these fine progressive men, eager to do the best they can, eager for the comradeship of young men and women who will come in and help them. Do not be indifferent to this fact. You can, 
if you will, find such a center. You will find such a man. Go and know him and help him. In doing your part in connection with such a center already established and needing support, you may find a comradeship with him and a companionship with the others beyond your wildest dreams. In this way also you will make a natural home and environment for your children for which as time passes you and they will be very grateful. Then by the very beauty of the truth and the life that they sense without coercion on your part or sanctioned coercion on the part of anyone, as it should always be in matters of religion and belief, they will come to natural acceptance of membership in and allegiance to such a home of the spirit. It may possibly save you from a many period of uncertainty and even of heartache. Time marches on. Truth marches on. The indifference of what we term Christianity to this fact is almost astounding. This made not such vital difference in the past, though a great loss was sustained. Today, however, is a different day. There is now available a vast amount of research in connection with the methods of the institutions of the past. Fear no longer holds. There is free research and free thinking. The honest search for truth leads men and women of today to the conclusion that no institution, whatever its self-constituted claims in the past, has or should have any rightful claim or hold on any free man or woman or any child. Things today move quickly. We are in an era of change. Old things, old systems are breaking up, sometimes almost overnight. We must be on the alert. Change is in the air everywhere, even revolution. Change is inevitable. How much wiser to see and to act in time that it be orderly, evolutionary revolution rather than a frenzied, destructive revolution which indiscriminately pulls down the good in conjunction with effete parasitic organizations of reaction that, no longer serving an adequate human purpose, should be pulled down. In the main, churches are ready to adapt themselves, but on the other hand, there are the institutions of dogma interested less in the people because now, as in the past, they are more interested in their self-preservation and evading or fighting, as it arises, all new truth which exposes the weakness of their structure or the falsity of their original foundation. An institution of dogma defends itself not by but against new truth, Hence, it cannot draw and cannot have the free allegiance of the thinking young men and women of today, this different day. End of chapter 22. Stay here right with me. I'm going to go ahead and move on right to the next chapter, 23, titled, How His Truth Compels Allegiance. If the Master's truth comes with a renewed life into the world, and especially in organization form, it will come primarily through the young men and women not entering the stage of action. They are of a truth-loving generation, thinking, searching, who quickly distinguish between truth and custom, truth and system. It is primarily in and through such young people that the hope of the master must lie. Youth is ever open to truth, and truth is ever young. Religion must be forever open to the flowing present with its continually unfolding truth, or it stagnates and cannot naturally and readily attract the young. That changes of conception and statement and methods must come and are brewing. No thoughtful person can have any doubt. One may easily imagine the master in conversation with an eager, clean-minded, clean-souled youth of today and glad of such a hearer to whom he could give an epitome of his mind and purpose, and still more of his observations, that they might be carried by him unto others of his age and kind. Certainly, it would be of great interest and value to the young man. The eagerness of youth today to get at the truth of things, especially of life and religion, of religion that may be of some value to life, would make the master just as eager to embrace the chance of such a conversation. It would be in such thorough keeping with his accustomed methods while here. 
as it was to Philip, one of his chosen disciples, that on a memorable occasion he gave a distinct message distinguishing between the flesh and the spirit, the symbol and the truth. So let us say that the name of the youth with whom he talks today is Philip. And let us suppose that Philip says eagerly, Those wonderful sayings of yours of the power of faith, they are almost beyond belief, and so few of us really comprehend them. How can they be true? You of your day, replies the master, are just coming upon one of the greatest facts of life, that thoughts are forces always creating. Faith is but a positive, clear-cut type of thought, held to, continually watered with expectation, it becomes creative in its action. Old as the world is the truth, as we think, we become. It is the law. We must sit as master at the helm. Otherwise, we drift, drift, drift. Thought is our sole possession. Prayer and faith and communion all come through the channel of thought. We must not only use it, but use it right. Courage comes through this type of thought. Faith and courage, or shall I reverse them? Courage and faith are, I say, but clear-cut types of thought that are continually working along the lines that we are going. If not, what sense would there be in what long ago I said? According to your faith, be it unto you. What right had I to say? If thou canst but believe, all things are possible to him who believeth. I have the right because thought is a force, a subtle, silent force, always creating and drawing conditions around us in accordance with the nature of the thought that we entertain and live with. We have it then in our own hands, says Phillips, to determine exactly what our lives are to be? Yes, replies the master. Search as you will, you will find no law more fundamental than that life always and inevitably follows the thought. But come, it is of the kingdom that we shall talk. Yes, says Philip, and how I long to understand aright. No, continues the master, that there is but the one life, the Father in whom we live and move and have our being. The life, the power that holds and moves the stars in their courses, is the life, the power that is in you. Only you must realize it and live always in this consciousness. God is spirit, the spirit that is yours. Look within. Realize the divine center within you, the Christ within. This is my revelation of the kingdom. When I said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, what did I mean? I said, God is spirit and the kingdom of God is within you, I meant that the infinite spirit of life that is behind all, working in and through all, is the life that is in you. As you realize this and live continually in this consciousness, you establish yourself in a conscious manner. You make the condition whereby you become an ever-increasing center of creative power. So my repeated injunction, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all other things shall be added unto you, means realize the divine life, the divine center within you, and you make the condition whereby the God life works in and through you by way of augmented direction and power. This is what I intended by my saying, the Father in me and I in the Father, and as I am, so shall you be. This is the secret the reason of my great insight and power, as it must be of every man's. It might be called the power of silent demand, the recognition and intelligent use of a force, which is an inherent faculty of every mind that realizes its life as one with the universal life. This, moreover, is now being understood and effectively used by men and women in increasing numbers. An older prophet sensed it when he said, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And so, do you see what I meant when I said, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly? That this greater abundance of life becomes yours when you identify your life with the God life within you? 
In this, and in my reply to the lawyer, you have my entire revelation and message to the world. The lawyer asked an honest question. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And I replied, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. With this, the truly inspired ones, the prophets, the seers, and saviors of all religious agree. Ask also that countryman of yours who had such a keen insight in separating the wheat from the chaff. Your own sainted Lincoln, when in his inspired answer to the question why he had not allied himself with a religious organization, he said, When any church will inscribe over its altar as its sole qualification of membership the Savior's condensed substance of both law and gospel, that church shall I join with all my heart and soul. And in this he prophesied what will in time become the qualification for membership in every real church in Christendom. Here lies not only the whole duty of man, but the essence of all religion, which is the consciousness of God in the mind and the soul of man. And how easy it is to understand the significance of love thy neighbor as thyself when we once know that we are all partakers of the one life, the same Father, and hence are all brothers. Love is the great cosmic law of all advancing and satisfying life the law that brings order out of chaos, the law that becomes the solvent of the riddle of life. All human relations await the capitalization of love, sympathy, mutuality, and the resultant cooperation to make them that splendid thing they can and eventually must be. It would actually mean then heaven on earth and the men and women of all nations would be the gainers? Yes, Philip, when men and women are wise enough to know and eager enough to follow this law, this way of life, a new life is born in each and a new world order comes in. And when, and only when, this is done, will this your world be changed from the rule of the tooth and claw of the jungle with its periodic fields of carnage into the paradise, the kingdom, it must and shall be. I know now, says Philip, that it is true. It is true not because I say it. I say it because it is true. The power of love is the primal force of the universe. The men and the nations that do not understand it march ceaseless columns to their own destruction. As Philip sits with rapt attention and thinking of himself, he asks, What about the sinner? For struggling and seeking men and women, for the sinners and the care-encumbered men and women, I always had pity, infinite pity and love. The only ones I ever condemned were those I spoke of as scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. They were those who would take the truths of the prophets and the inspired ones and, interested in themselves and their own systems, rather than in the essence of the truths, would weave them into thorny crowns to press on other men's brows. And so today, as through the ages, the enemies of my truth and my cause, the hinderers, are those who conjecture and build systems about me, but who fail to keep my commandments, to do the things I have said to do, and to pass them on in simple purity to a sorrowing, fearing, and half-living world. Oh, had I but known this, what your real message to the world is, how different my life would have been and how different it would be today. You have suffered, replies the master, but you have great love. It is because of this and your longing to know the truth which makes men free and which makes their life full, joyous and abundant that I am glad to talk with you. My message is this message of the kingdom. Find this inner kingdom, live in it, and then... As I said, do not worry about your life. Take it and find in it peace and power. Neglect it, miss it, and you will continue in fears and forebodings, in weakness of mind and of spirit, and its resultant weakness of body. What about your death being a substitution, a ransom for the sins of the human race? 
Do you mean before or since my time? We know now that vast millions lived on the earth before I came, but in either case it was all news to me, otherwise I would have said something about it during my life and ministry here. It was founded upon a mythical and imaginary occurrence that you know now never took place. It was founded upon the imagined and alleged fall and consequent degradation of the human race. I knew nothing of it in my time. Be that as it may, my revelation and entire teaching were exactly the opposite. Not the natural sinfulness and degradation, but the divinity of the human soul. All are sons of God, and God is love, not anger and a such demanding an early Jewish conception of a sacrifice and of an atonement for an error or a sin, especially one that the individual never committed. That such a thing could be believed and made to enslave so many people mentally and spiritually is astounding. That it persists in even a few minds yet, in the light of my teachings, and especially when combined with your present-day knowledge, is even more so. The vast amount of money made from benighted fearful people through the ages and strangely enough even now, in dealing in my body and my blood is amazing. But as fear and ignorance go, the truth that I taught will grow, that God is love, and as a loving Father longs always for the Son's return, longs for Him to repent and turn again to His love and care. Read now again my parable of the prodigal son. Why did I give it? I realize that so many have need of this same light. Why, asked Philip, hasn't the world this wonderful truth which seems now so simple after all these years? Men are divided and have at times grown even to hate one another in their divisions because they were unable to agree in theories about me, mere matters of opinion, things that do not matter, why they miss the one great thing that does matter, the truth that I brought to the world. This has fallen upon deaf ears. They do not do as I said. They do not keep my commandment. They do not seek the inner kingdom that brings everything else in its train. They do not find the Christ within. They do not love one another. The result is fear. Fear everywhere. Discontent, want, envy, jealousy, strife, and periodic war and world disruption. I shall bless the day, says Philip, when we shall understand so that it will not be so hard for you. Yes, at times my heart bleeds, for I would be the savior of men by saving them from their lower conceptions and selves and lifting their minds and spirits up to that divine image and heritage which is theirs. But my great joy is in the rapidly increasing numbers all over the world who are now getting my real message and the wonderful life that unfolds in them with the getting. And when enough get it, then a new world comes in. If I can but keep this vision, says Philip enraptured, and live this life and can even to a humble degree impart it to others. You will, Philip, for I feel that now you understand. Always remember then that I gave summary of my life and my revelation to the world in my reply to the lawyer when I said that the whole of life is love of God and service to the neighbor. From this, all else flows. Love to God is realization of the divine life within us and living always under its care and guidance. Love to the neighbor shows itself in sympathy and in kindly regard for all men. You have now the secret of life. I need you. I long for my message to go more simply to the minds and hearts of eager, care-encumbered people. You have come through suffering. You have eaten of the husk, and now you have the real bread of life. You know now that the human spirit is divine, part and parcel of the infinite divine life. You will grow in this realization, and growing in it and living in it, you will play a part in bringing others to a knowledge of the kingdom within. Then turning as if he listens to something in the far distance, Jesus says, I shall go shortly. A ruler asks my help. Earnestly he seeks to follow the way. He is fearful and disturbed, but his heart is right. He is getting the clear vision that there is but the one life, the Father, and that all men are brothers, that love, service, mutuality, cooperation constitute the way of life. 
and that until this is realized and all human relations built upon it, there is no hope in sight. When it is really learned, the new world comes in. The historian of the future will, I believe, point to ours as a time when a great change took place in Christendom. Men and women, and especially young men and women, now far more free from ancestral and inherited inhibitions than any before them, begin to ask, not do you believe this or that about the Christ, but do you believe the things of the Christ, the things he taught? Do you sense his life and his power? Do you believe him when he states the source of his power and when he says that the same power under the same law is available for all who believe his words and who follow him? A new spirit, a wonderful spirit comes into Christianity with promise of a great religious revival throughout Christendom, more profound and vital than it has ever known. Men and women in a growing host find God and the peace and the power that come with the finding, and they manifest God, they realize as never before the relations one with another. They begin to understand that love is the fundamental law of the life of the universe. With this new vision, they begin to put love, sympathy, mutuality, and cooperation to work so that they actually pervade their personal lives and next their social, their community, their business and industrial lives. Then the affairs of their state and nation, finally their relations with all other nations, from their ranks come a poet and prophet saying, No matter how the die is cast, or who may seem to win, we know that we must love at last. Why not begin? This is really the culmination of what clear-seeing writer of another nation, Victor Hugo, had in mind when he said, there's one thing that is stronger than armies, and that is an idea whose time has come. Young people in vast numbers, they who for a time seemed to their elders to be drifting on mere pleasure bent, even as the prodigal young people in vast numbers come and sit at the feet of Christ and learn of him, they find him free. Frank and open, the enemy of Kant, formalism and hypocrisy in religion and life. They find him arresting and virile, in love with life, especially the life in the open, just as they are. They find a matchless love and beauty in his personality that thrills and captivates them and draws them ever closer to him. They find him eager to give forth life, the more abundant life, the free life of the spirit, which he, through his great faculty of discerning the laws and the things of the mind and the spirit, perceived and lived, so that he speaks to them as one having authority. The life which transformed him from Joshua ben Joseph, the carpenter of the little village of Nazareth, to the Christ Jesus, the world's Savior. And truly, they say, as they know him better, He is our Savior, for He saves us from our lower conceptions and selves. He is our Redeemer, for He redeems us from the domination, the bondage of the senses and excesses, and the heavy bills that we eventually would have to pay. He is truly the Son of God, the Mediator, for He shows us that we too are the sons of God. Truly God is our Father, as well as His Father even as he said, and we are brothers. We will be true to his teaching of the way, to our better selves. We will so live and work that a new world order will come in, the kingdom of God here on earth. For did he not say the kingdom of God is at hand? And his life, revelation, and work will bear more nearly the fruit that he so longed for, that he so magnificently lived, and so heroically died for. Thinking men and women the world over, sitting in an ever larger company directly at the master's feet, are discovering that he perceived unerringly that he lived and taught, not a creeping through process, but our Father in heaven. The unity, the at of the human spirit with the divine, 
They are finding that to know God the Father, whom he so intimately knew and revealed, and to know him as by him revealed, gives a religion of a joyous, conquering power, by virtue of the higher forces of the divine life and power, eternally latent within, springing forward into a useful, creative, and ever-growing activity. They believe, moreover, that he who knows God here and gives evidence that he knows him by a loving, upright, manly, helpful, and humble manner of living will be known by God, both here and hereafter, as the Master so clearly taught. They believe it because they are drawn irresistibly, as they know him better, to believe the man who knew. The End And this is the end of chapter 23 and also the end and conclusion of the reading of the book, The Man Who Knew by Ralph Waldo Trine. And I say to you, all is love. Show me some love. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this book and know of someone that could be uplifted by it. Please do share it. And hey, subscribe to the channel and we'll meet each other somewhere on my channel at the next video, wherever that might be.